What's up, everybody? My name is Shane Kohler, and this is The Conscious Love Show. Thanks so much for joining me here, where each week I'm sharing true-to-life insights and experiences from my journey and how I've created the loving and committed partnership I have today. I answer your questions and have live discussions with you so I can support you in your specific situation. And I bring in experts and people who know their stuff so we can all learn from their perspectives. Thanks again for checking out the show. Please subscribe on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on the most. And I would love it so much if you'd leave a review and tell people what you think of us. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at The Living Relationship to connect more closely. And I'm grateful to be supporting you on your journey to love. Welcome back to another episode of the Conscious Love Show, everybody. Uh, Shane here, as always. It's a pleasure. Very excited to be back with you today. Dive into another topic around conscious love, conscious dating, conscious relationships, and you know how do we create this? How do we manifest that? So on this show, for those of you who might be new or just joining into the show for the first time, this is a show where each week we do a deep dive into some aspect of conscious love and conscious relationships. And um, what I really try to do here is, you know, address the things that people are not speaking about, address the deeper aspects of things. You know, people are really fast to give you that um, three things to say to make him fall in love with you kind of advice. You know, people are really fast to give you the bullshit. But when it comes to the, the real process of manifesting love, of, you know, creating real, authentic, committed love in your life. Um, you know, it's, it's not always as simple as three magic words that are going to make him fall for you, but it's more about who you're being, how you're showing up in the world, how you're relating to not just men or relationships, but ultimately how you're relating to life as a whole and how you relate with yourself. So this is an episode where we, or excuse me, this is a show where we dive into those deeper questions, where we dive into those deeper discussions. And we, we really do, we really do a lot of deep dives here on the show. Those of you who've been with me for a while, you know what I'm talking about. And, um, in today's episode, what we're speaking into is narcissism. And I really wanted to do a deep dive on this topic because it's just so pervasive you know, uh, I, I just hear it thrown around so much where my narcissistic ex or, you know, uh, just, I mean, every, everything you can imagine. I, I was married to a narcissist for 20 years and this is how, you know, I was abused and, and these different things. And, and in today's society and in today's culture, um, especially in the Western world, which is where I live and I don't have a lot of experience with other cultures, some, but, but I know that especially in the Western world, and it is quite pervasive through, throughout the whole world to a degree, I know, is this, this um, we can call it an epidemic of narcissism, right? Where it, it just is so pervasive and so, um, yeah, you, I mean, you see it everywhere. You see it in all kinds of people. And so what I really wanted to do today is, is have a conversation about how to confront narcissism in the dating world. And really just discuss like, what is it? Where does it come from? Why is it happening? And what do we do with it? Right? The reality of our world is that we, we live in a world that promotes narcissism, encourages narcissism. And from the time we're very little, it, it, we are in a lot of ways encouraged to become narcissistic. And I think there are pockets of this in all of our lives. And there are people who have gone to an extreme with it. And we could say they have become a narcissist, right? They, where the, the narcissistic aspects of themselves have become the greater aspect of who they are. And this is something that, you know, when you're, when you're dating, it's, um, it's kind of inevitable. I think, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna come across a narcissist or two in your dating journey. So what I really want to do today is just do a deep dive into this conversation of narcissism and hopefully shed some light and and support everyone in understanding, in healing, and also empowering yourself. Right? When you're when you're looking for love and you're looking for something real and deep and true and honest, and the we could say the water you're swimming in right, is, is very toxic. 
you need to know how to, how to be with that toxicity. You need to know how to position yourself within this toxic water that we're swimming in. And I, th- I think so many of us, when it comes to love, and this was me for a long time, as I was, I was expecting a relationship to come into my life, but I wasn't really present to what a, what a task that really was, right? Like I was expecting myself to find my person. I was expecting love to come into my life. I was expecting it all to happen for me, but I wasn't really present to the task that it actually is to what it really, what really is required to receive and and manifest authentic love into your life. And I truly believe that we cannot create that for ourselves. We cannot have that authentic committed love without also addressing and knowing how to deal with the toxicity that is all around us all the time right? We need to position ourselves as someone who is empowered within the toxicity. And if we don't position ourselves in that way, that those toxic influences that surround us will constantly and consistently drain us of our power. It will constantly and consistently uh, consistently diminish our power, right? And so we need to know how to position ourselves within that and how to be empowered within, within this see that we're all kind of swimming in here. And so dealing with the topic of narcissism, and I would say if, if I were going to categorize narcissism as something specific here, I, I would, I would start by saying that what we call a narcissist, what we refer to, you know, when, when someone says my ex is a narcissist, or I was, I experienced narcissistic abuse for 20 years, right? What, what a narcissist is, or what narcissism is, is it is the extreme manifestation of the toxicity that exists within all of us. It's it's something that is culturally present. It's something that we pick up in our upbringing. It's something that is promoted to us in the movies and the music and the media. It's something that is just so pervasive in our culture. And as human beings, you know, we're we're in a really interesting position here where, you know, as human beings, we are spiritual beings having a physical experience, right? We are, we could say we are love. We are the universal essence of life, which is love. And we are, we are love that has forgotten what it is. And so, you know, you could, if you look at a child, it becomes very obvious, like what we're made of. Right? When you look at a child who hasn't developed a strong ego yet, when you look at a child who hasn't developed these fear-based beliefs that cause it to want to control and manipulate the world, to have power over other people, to keep things for myself that you can't have, right? It's like, these are, these are all the things that we develop as we grow up. But children are not born with these things. So I think the essence of a human being is very obvious when you look at a child. And the essence of love that is is really present at the core of who we are is very, very obvious when you look at a child. But then as children, we're born into a world that is very much the opposite of love. And that's why I say as human beings, we are love that has forgotten what it is right? We are, we are made out of love and we have forgotten what we are. We have forgotten where we come from. And so we come into this world as love, these beautiful children who laugh and play and sing and dance and cry. And they're just the full expression of life in, in every aspect of it. And then as, as we grow up in this toxic world, this world that does not honor the authenticity of a human being, this world that places your value on what you achieve versus who you are, this world that is constantly sending you the message that you are not enough, this world that is constantly sending you the message that if you want to be worthy, you have to do X, Y, and Z. And if, if you have a, a normal kind of regular life, you're nothing, right? And this celebrity culture where we put people on pedestals and we compare ourselves to them and find ourselves lacking in all of this, right? And I'm just giving a few examples here, but this is the world that we've been born into. And what happens for us is 
very early on in life. You know, I've said this before where you can start to see when that two-year-old child starts to develop their ego, right? And all of a sudden they say, no, I don't want to share my toy. This is my toy. You go get your own, right? And we can start to see how the ego develops even at a very young age and how the ideas of scarcity and lack and needing to control and needing to keep something to myself to make myself feel safe even starts to show up in children at a very young age because children are sponges and they pick up the impressions of the world around them. And if, if you listen to the podcast or if you've been with me before, this is not new information, right? Like, I mean, I talk about this stuff quite frequently, but you can see very clearly how the ego develops and how children create these protective barriers around them. And by the time, you know, you're in middle school or especially high school, and I mean, even earlier than that, I mean, I remember getting bullied in elementary school and, and a lot of you probably did too, right? And it's like, we are born into this toxic sea. And at a very early time in our lives, we start to feel that we need to survive in this toxic sea. And narcissism is the extreme of that. Narcissism is what happens when this need to survive in a toxic world is taken to the extreme. Narcissism is what happens when somebody cannot find any value in themselves authentically, right? They cannot recognize the gift that they are, the beauty that they are, the love that they are. When somebody becomes completely disconnected from that, what happens is their only way to continue to live, their only way to continue to wake up in the morning and and be okay is to create a grandiose image of themselves. And so the, the themes that, you know, really characterize narcissism are things like constantly wanting um, admiration and acknowledgement from other people, right? Always look at me, always tell me how great I am, always love me, always admire me. Um, a lack of empathy, right? A lack of empathy where I don't have the ability to connect to someone else's experience on an emotional level. In fact, in narcissism, empathy is replaced with judgment, right? So where, where somebody who has an open, loving heart would see someone suffering and they would see someone's pain and their open heart would feel that pain from that person, and there would be a natural tendency to empathize with what that person is going through and to feel what that person is feeling. Narcissism closes down the heart. It, it does not have access to that empathetic response that is very natural to a human being with an open heart. And that empathy is then replaced with judgment. And the reason, like what judgment provides really to all of us. And, and this is why we judge and we all judge in different ways. But in, in the narcissistic consciousness, what happens is the judgment creates a feeling of superiority, right? So if I see you suffering and rather than empathizing with you where I can, in empathy, I can feel what you're feeling. I can see the sameness between us. I can see the likeness between us. I can see how your pain is very similar to the pain I've experienced. And I can, I can feel that with you, right? Well, when I'm not open to feeling that within myself, what I do is I judge you for your pain. And I say you're weak or you're pathetic or you're whatever, right? But I, I place some kind of judgment on you around it. And that gives me a feeling of superiority. That gives me a feeling of being better than you. And this is what creates the grandiose self-image that narcissists are known for. This is what creates the, um, the entitlement that narcissists feel. But what I, what I really want to speak into today, because there is no healing 
in judgment. There is no healing in judging someone as a narcissist. And, you know, when, when we do that and what happens, what happens in the culture around narcissism is that we, we end up making these people wrong for who they are. We end up making these people like the devil, like the boogeyman, like the evil doers. And when we place judgment on that, what we are doing is we are sinking ourselves to that level, right? And when we place judgment on a narcissist, we are invoking the same mechanism that they use and we are getting the same result that they get, which means we feel superior. We feel righteous. We feel entitled. And that is just as toxic as what they're doing. And so if we want to, if we want to heal ourselves and other people, we have got to develop a deep capacity for empathy. We've got to develop a deep capacity to be able to recognize what someone else is going through and feel that with them, feel that for them. And Something that um, a teacher of mine taught me a long time ago, and I've, I've never forgotten this, and it's, it's a fundamental part of everything I teach, is that it takes a victim to make a victim. It takes a victim to make a victim. There is not one single person on this planet who has hurt another human being who is not also in pain themselves. It has never happened, ever, right? It, there is not one single person in the history of human beings who go out and hurt someone else who are not also in pain themselves. Because the fact is that healed people, people who live with a full, loving, open heart, they're not out there hurting people. They are out there blessing the world. They are out there present to the pain that people are going through, present to the suffering that people are in. And rather than judging people for that, they are sending love towards it. They are doing what they can to serve. They are doing what they can to help. They are doing what they can to contribute. Because the thing is that healed people know what it is to suffer. Because healed people are the people who rather than avoiding their own suffering, which is what most people do. And by the way, avoiding your own suffering is one of the clearest paths to narcissism. And we'll talk a little bit about that today, right? Like avoiding your own suffering, repressing your own suffering leads to narcissism. Healed people are the people who have learned to be with their own suffering to love themselves through their suffering, to honor their suffering. And as a result of being able to be present to those deepest and most vulnerable aspects of themselves, they have developed the capacity to be empathetic to the suffering of others. And so when you see a narcissist, which even, I want to say this because even categorizing someone as a narcissist, is a little bit dehumanizing, right? When you, when you, when you make someone a narcissist, when you call someone a narcissist, you are basically making them less than human when you do that. What would be a more accurate statement about who they really are rather than your judgment on them because they hurt you or because they did something or said something that you don't like, or you don't agree with. Right, But what would be a more accurate statement for someone like that is that this is a deeply wounded human being that has reverted to narcissism as a way of protecting themselves from their own pain. And if you just can be present to that for a second, and, and I know like a lot of you listening to this right now, whether you're live with me today, whether you're hearing this on the podcast, but a lot of you who are hearing this right now are people who have been deeply hurt by narcissistic behavior. And a lot of you are probably carrying some big resentment about that. 
a lot of you are probably carrying some hate around that. A lot of you are probably carrying some disdain and some heavy judgment against the people who hurt you, against the people that you've called narcissists. And what I want you to realize is that when you lack the ability to see and empathize with what that person is going through or has gone through in their lives, you are sinking yourself to their level. Right? When someone hurts you, we could say they're a narcissist or someone exhibiting narcissistic behavior. And when they hurt you, and rather than recognizing why they hurt you and where it came from and what was going on for them that caused that hurt, you label them as a narcissist and you judge them and you make them evil. Well, now you are taking on the same vibrational quality of experience that caused that they were experiencing that caused them to hurt you in the first place. And to the degree that you allow yourself to carry that within you is the degree that you will create the same kinds of pain and suffering in other people. And this is what, um, simply put, this is what we call generational trauma. Right. This is, and it doesn't even happen generation to generation, right? It, it, it happens among friendships. It happens like it happens among the same generation. It happens among your peers. But when you take on that same vibrational quality of an inability to empathize, an inability to understand the bigger picture and see what's happening, you are equating yourself to that same vibration. And that doesn't make you a narcissist. But what it will do is cause you to exhibit narcissistic behavior in certain aspects of your life. And so this is, this is a big theme of mine. And I've, I've, spoken, I've spoken about this many times. But, you know, to, to find authentic love to find true love, to, to manifest the love of your life, the partner of your dreams, you know, whatever, whatever that is to you. It's not enough to just be a normal kind of person. And, and please understand that uh, th- there's, there's some nuance here because I'm not saying that you are not enough. You actually are enough. But what most people are embodying in their life is like a sleepwalking version of themselves. And most of us are living with a deep amount of pain, a a deep amount of trauma. And to avoid that pain and that trauma, we have closed down certain aspects of ourselves. And what we have actually done is we have closed down the most loving aspects of ourselves. Because love transcends all of that. Love, you see, love is bigger than your pain and your trauma. Love is bigger than the suffering you've experienced. Love is bigger than the hate you might feel for someone. It's like, we often think about love and hate as though they're opposites. They are not opposites, okay? Hate is so much weaker than love. They are not opposites because to be opposites, they would have to be equal. Hate is less than love. Hate is weaker than love. Love is great enough to encompass all of that, right? So so love actually heals hate because it is greater than hate. But when we have deprived ourselves of the love that is within us, when we've experienced pain and suffering and trauma, and as a result of that, we've, we've felt our vulnerability. We have felt what maybe we thought was our weakness. And we tried to protect ourselves from that. And so in doing that, in feeling that vulnerability and feeling that maybe what we thought was weakness and trying to protect ourselves from that, we have closed down access to the love that we're made of. 
We've closed down access to the, to the love that is the fundamental essence of all life in the universe. And hate is something that emerges as a result of that. When we are disconnected from the love that's inside of us, only then do we have the ability to hate. Only then do we have the ability to hurt others. Only then do we have the ability to act out in toxic behavior. Only then do we lack empathy. And what I really want to communicate here is that to the degree that you have closed down your heart, to the degree that you have shut down your vulnerability, that is the degree that you will experience and act out in narcissistic behavior. And all, if we're going to say people are narcissists, all that really means is that they've gone so far to that side of the spectrum that they have little to no access to anything else. And when you meet someone who is living that experience, that doesn't call for judgment or for punishment. That calls for compassion. Now, some of you are probably even triggered when I say that, right? Some of you are probably triggered by the idea that the people who hurt you the most need your compassion. And if, if that's you, if you're triggered by that statement or if you're struggling with this right now, my question to you would be, how much do you want to experience love? How much do you want to experience love in your life? Because every single time you replace compassion with judgment, you are closing down your own capacity to experience love. And so how is that going to translate? That's going to translate into you attracting more narcissistic type people into your life. Because every amount of hate that you hold in your heart Every amount of resentment that you hold in your heart, every amount of judgment that you hold in your heart is vibrationally equating you to the level of narcissistic consciousness. And if you carry that with you, you will attract that. And I'm just going to say, the more you attract that, the more you will become that. Now, I know that's a tough pill to swallow. Because nobody wants to think of themselves as a narcissist. And I was reading, um, I was reading a, a, a Brene Brown's Daring Greatly this morning. If, if anybody uh, would like to dive deeper into these kinds of conversations, she's a great person who really sheds incredible light on this. Brene Brown, for anyone who's interested. Um, but I was reading Brene Brown's Daring Greatly today. And, you know, she, she made the comment in the book. She goes, you know, if you're reading this right now, you're probably thinking, yeah, that's a pretty adic- that's a pretty adequate description of most people, but not of me. <laughs> and isn't that how we all feel? Oh yeah. Well that describes most people, but that doesn't describe me. Well, here's what I'm going to say. If you were born onto planet earth, if you were, and especially if you were born into the Western world, although again, this is This is pervasive in most cultures, I think, but especially here in the Western world where we are very materialistic and we are very, uh, a lot of the, you know, in, in the Western world, there is a theme of, how do I want to put this? It's like, um, it's like basically stomping all over the sacredness of life, right? We take what's sacred and we make it mundane. A great example of this is what we've done with sex in the Western world, right? Whereas historically speaking for thousands and thousands of years in, in, you know, many, many cultures, sex was considered an act of incredible intimacy and an act of like incredible beauty and incredible like vulnerability and opening yourself up to another person in, in like the deepest way possible. 
and it was something sacred and it was something beautiful. And in the Western world, what we've done is we've turned it into a mundane act. And this is in, in the Western culture, this is what we do with everything sacred in life. And again, I think, I think this is pervasive and it's becoming more and more pervasive um, among all cultures, right? I think Westernization is spreading and, and this, this, uh, element of, of, you know, basically stomping all over the sacredness of life is, is pervasive, uh, you know, in, in most cultures in the world now. But this is, this is the essence of narcissism, right? When you hold nothing as sacred anymore, when you have no connection to yourself as a spiritual being, when you have no connection to yourself as a being that is made out of love, that comes from love, that is a living embodiment of love, when you view yourself and the world as materialistic, and everything is material, nothing is spiritual. Narcissism is the side effect of that. Because the spiritual aspect of you is everything that you are in reality. And the material aspect of you, your body, your mind, your clothing, your job, the house you live in, the car you drive, the jewelry you wear, like, you know, whatever, whatever it is, the material aspects of you, that's not who you are at all, right? That's just a, that's just a game you're playing for a little while. And when you, I want to say there's nothing wrong with playing that game. That's what we're here to do. We are here to play this game. And I believe we are here to play this game of materialism full out, right? To live in the material world, to be, to be made of the material world, to experience ourselves within this materialism. We are here to play this game and to play it full out. But the way to win at this game, and, and by winning, I don't mean beating other people. Winning in my paradigm means we all win together. But the way to win at this game is to bring the spiritual essence of who you are into the material. It's to let the spiritual essence of who you are give life to the material. To bring beauty and grace and love to the material world, right? That is what we're here to do. That is how to win at this game of life. And in a society... Or, or an individual, which, you know, the individuals are, are usually products of the society. And in a society where we place the material over the spiritual, where the spiritual or the authentic becomes something that's in the back seat, and the material or the pretend or the charade becomes the driving force, that is narcissism in a nutshell. When I am completely disconnected from the truth of who I am and I overcompensate for that by these grandiose, exaggerated ideas about who I am in my limited form, in my body, in the material aspects of myself, and I do that to overcompensate for the feeling of emptiness that pervades every area of my life. That is narcissism. And if you live on that level, if you live on that level where the material aspects of you are the forefront and the spiritual aspects of you are in the background, then you will be in this, what do I want to call it? This kind of sea of hate and attack and drama and chaos and resentment and battling back and forth. And well, you shouldn't have done that. And I can't believe, and can you believe what they said to me? And what kind of person would do that? And all this, all this really heightened, dramatic stuff. 
And when you have the spiritual aspects of you in the forefront, when your life is led by the spiritual aspects of who you are and the material aspects of who you are are there, but they become more of a channel for your love to move through rather than a part of your identity. You will transcend all of that. And love will become the primary force in your life. And the thing about love is is it's total. Right? Love does not make special... What's the word I'm looking for? Like special favors or special assessments. Right? Love does not say this person is better than this person. I did a podcast a few weeks ago talking about the power of equality. And, and what I was talking about is, is this very idea is that love recognizes the inherent equality in everyone. Love recognizes the inherent equality in everything. Love sees that you are just as good as me and I'm just as good as that person and everyone is just as good as everyone. There is no better or worse. But the specialness that the ego is seeking is the foundation of all narcissism. And most people are looking to feel special. And you can search your own heart right now and see if that's you. But most people are looking to feel special. In fact, when we seek love, And most of the time when we are seeking love, when we are seeking that, again, special someone who's going to love me and make me feel special and make, and, and adore me and make me feel great. Like that is all based in, in this desire for specialness, which again is the foundation of narcissism. And so what I'm really challenging you to do here, and you've got to be a really mature person to have this conversation right now, because some of you are going to get triggered by this. Some of you are not going to want to hear this. But if you are attracting narcissistic people into your life, then you've really got to get honest with yourself and say, where are the narcissistic aspects of me? What are those places in myself that is calling this in? Because I'm going to tell you, like, if that wasn't there, you would not be attracting people like that into your life. Like attracts like. And and let let me even put it this way. This is maybe a better way because we could say that you might attract all kinds of people into your life, right? You might... If you're, if you're looking good and you're feeling good and you've got great energy and you're walking down the street, there are going to be all kinds of people who are attracted to you. All right. So we could say that you might attract all different kinds of people into your life, but here's the truth. If there were not narcissistic qualities within your own heart, you might attract some narcissistic people, but you would not be attracted to narcissistic people. And that's a tough pill to swallow. But the reason you are attracted to those people is because you see and you feel something in them that resonates with something that you see and feel within yourself. And that makes you want to link up with them like... And again, you've got to be a really mature person to have this conversation right now because most people don't want to look at their shadow. Most people don't want to look at the untoward aspects of themselves, right? What do most people want to do? Most people want to be victims. They want to blame. They want to judge. They want to criticize. They want to say, I'm doing everything right. I'm doing everything perfect. Everything's fine with me and everyone else is the fuck up. 
Well, let me tell you, I'm just going to be straightforward right now. If you are chasing down people and like highly attracted to people that are not truly loving, heartfelt people, then there is something within you that is seeking that. And that is coming from an, un- from an unhealed place. And, and I want to tell you, like, I am not blaming you for that. I am not. What I want you to recognize is this is the water we swim in. You were born into a world where narcissism was one of the driving forces in this world. The music and the television and the media that you've been listening to ever since you were a little kid has been promoting narcissistic themes. The ideas of love that have been impressed upon you throughout your life are versions of love that are wrought with specialness and narcissism. And it's not your fault that you've picked up these impressions. You couldn't have done it any other way. But it is your responsibility to heal them. And if you don't heal these aspects of yourself, then you will sink deeper and deeper and deeper into this. And you will attract and be attracted to more and more and more of this. And your life will become dominated by these toxic forces. And probably the worst part about it is the whole time you'll think that you were a victim. And that you had no responsibility in it. And so I want to give some concrete examples right now, because I know some of you are probably saying, okay, Shane, theoretically, I can understand what you're talking about, but give me some real examples, right? Like how does this show up in my life? And before I say this, I just want to say, get ready because some of what I'm about to share might trigger you. If you are approaching love from a place of wanting someone to love you rather than wanting to love someone, that is fundamentally a narcissistic approach. Now, I know that might sound crazy to you because you're going, what do you mean? Isn't it normal to want someone to love me? Isn't it like, doesn't it, isn't that what everybody wants? Well, yeah, most people do want that. And like, let me, let me be clear about this. Okay. Because there, there's definitely some nuance here and there is a fundamental human need to be loved, to be treated with kindness, to be respected, to be honored. Right. And that is something we all have. So I'm not talking about that. But I'm talking about this desire that we have to be special, this desire to have someone make us their special person. Because to even, to even desire that, to even want to be special is coming from a narcissistic place. You see, that that need to be special is coming from the place in you that feels that you're not enough. And so you overcompensate for that feeling of not enough by saying, well, if I can be someone's special person, if someone can adore me, if someone can worship the ground I walk on, if someone can make me that special person to them, then I'll be enough. And that is, again, I I know you might not frame it this way, you might not frame it in that language, but that is the vibrational equivalent of narcissism. 
because specialness is separateness, right? The the desire to be special is the desire to be lifted up above other people. And that's toxic. And the more you seek specialness in your life, the more you will hurt yourself and the more you will hurt other people. And you see, this is what ends up happening from that place. And and then a lot of you are going to relate to what I'm about to share. Is when you are seeking that specialness, when you need to be special to someone, then what you also need is you need someone who is special to make you special. Right? Because you can't just, if, if you need to be special, you can't just have little old Joe Schmo being in love with you, that doesn't mean anything, right? Joe Schmo's a fucking loser. His love doesn't mean anything to me. I need Ryan Gosling's love (laughs) or the equivalent. It's so funny. In the podcast last week, I was talking about how the Ryan Gosling look is this, uh, is like this, um, like, cultural Prince Charming we've set up, right? Like the guys who kind of have this Ryan Gosling look, they're like the, they're like the cultural Prince Charmings, right? And I didn't even realize, I found this out last night because I haven't seen the movie, but I found this out last night that Ryan Gosling was actually cast as Ken in the Barbie movie. And I'm like, you can't make this shit up. Like you cannot make this shit up. And there's nothing wrong with Ryan Gosling. He's, a, he's an incredibly talented actor. I'm not, I'm not knocking him as a human being. But I'm saying that look is the look that we have put on a pedestal as this special person. And if someone who looks like that will love me, that will make me special too. And you see, you cannot want that without there inherently being a level of judgment in your consciousness. A level where you're looking at everyone who doesn't look like that. And you're judging them as somehow unworthy. And so what ends up happening when you have this desire for specialness is you place yourself in a constant comparison with everyone and everything else in life. And you're constantly viewing people as less than you or better than you. And you feel superior to the people who are less than you. And you feel inferior to the people that you view as better than you. And then what starts to happen is you get involved in a relationship with someone. Right? And, you, and maybe this person, and, and maybe they look the way you need them to look, and they act the way you need them to act, and, they, and they're, they're all the special stuff that you're looking for, and you go, oh my God, it's finally happening to me. I finally feel special. It, it's you know, finally taking place. And then you get involved with this person, and you get involved in this relationship, and you're on fucking cloud nine, and you're like, oh my God, I finally feel special. I finally feel like I'm enough. And then... One of two things is going to happen. This person is either going to be a toxic nightmare because they've been playing into the same narcissistic special stuff that you've been playing into. Or, this is the other option, this person is not going to be that. They're actually going to be a, something different than that, something genuine something loving, something human. And when you see that genuine, loving, vulnerable humanness in them, you will judge them for it. Because you see, when you're seeking specialness, you need that person to be that perfect thing and you cannot receive their humanness I see a comment here it says I get it but there also has to be an attraction yeah 
I'm with you on that. There does have to be attraction. Okay, but here's what you might be missing. And people always say this, like, oh, well, I need to be attracted to the person. I'm not saying that you won't be attracted to the person, but you've got to start to, you've got to be wise enough to ask yourself, why am I attracted to the people I'm attracted to? And on a surface level consciousness, you think it's about the way somebody looks. It is not about the way they look. Yes, there, there is, there is a general, you know, for example, you know, if somebody is grossly overweight or if somebody is in very poor health in some other kind of respect, like there, there are some, there are some genuine factors to attraction, like some, some objective factors to attraction. Okay. But if you, if you line up a handful of people who in general look roughly the same, you know, they might have different hair colors. They might have different eye colors. They might have slightly different body types, but in general that we could say that they're, they're relative, they're relatively of equal attraction. But then within that lineup, there are certain people that you are more attracted to than others. That's not an accident. It's not an accident that you are attracted to those people. And you are attracted to those people because those are the people that you resonate with on a vibrational level. And look, I've been doing this work for a long time and I've talked about attraction with thousands and thousands of men and women, right? And this is what I found is that when someone heals the kind of stuff that I'm talking about right now, their impossible standards for attraction start to become a lot more flexible and they start to authentically feel attraction with different kinds of people in different kinds of experiences because attraction is not about how someone looks. You know, I remember, um, there was a a guy I was coaching several years ago and that he was, he was telling me very similar to what the, the comment that was just brought up, right? And he was telling me, he's like, you know, I I get it. Like, I just, I, I know that physical attraction should not be that important, but I just can't shake it. He's like, the only thing I'm attracted to is the South beach blonde with big boobs and the whole deal. And he's like, that's just, that's just what I'm attracted to. I just can't shake it. I know it shouldn't be that important, but it is that important. And here's what I said to him. I said, I get it, brother. I get it. I've been there. But there's something you need to realize is that the people who look like that, the people who have that look tend to also have a certain kind of personality because they don't look that way by accident. It's not an accident that they look that way, right? They look that way because that's who, that's how they believe they need to look based on the cultural programming they've received, based on the impressions that they've received throughout their life since childhood. They believe that this is what they need to look like in order to be worthy or lovable or accepted or liked or, or whatever, right? And so because they have played into the cultural narrative of how they need to look, they have also played into the cultural narrative of who they need to be. And I'm not saying there aren't exceptions. There are definitely exceptions. I I know several women who look like that, but do not behave like that. I know several men who have that Ryan Gosling look, but are not narcissists. Okay, so there are exceptions, but in general, the people who are run and have their lives driven by the need to look that way are also run and have their lives driven by the need to be that way. And if you have been programmed to only be attracted to that, then I hate to say it, you're swimming in the same water. If you haven't done enough soul searching to be attracted to someone's depth and their authenticity 
and their kindness and their generosity and their compassion and their empathy, if you have not reached that level of depth within yourself, then you're swimming in the same water. And I'm not saying that makes you a complete and total, uh, a complete and total narcissist. But it does put you within the paradigm where you're going to attract narcissists and where you're going to be attracted to narcissists. So I was thinking about this earlier and I was thinking about how when I was growing up and probably, you know, for kids these days, uh, I sound old when I say that. Uh, but probably, you know, it's probably still the same, I would imagine. But I remember when I was in like middle school, high school, hip hop and rap music was just, it, it was, it was a big deal. Everybody was listening to it. And I remember the themes that were consistently expressed in hip hop and rap music, at least to the, to the young boys was look at how great I am. Look at how much money I have. Look at the car I drive. Look at the clothes I wear. Look at how many women want me. Look at how much power I have over other people. Look at my guns and my weaponry and and how, how I can take a life without even thinking about it. And the children in our culture, especially the boys, and I think, I think women get a, a slightly different impression. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But the boys in our culture, this is what they are taught about what it means to be cool, what it means to be liked, what it means to fit in, what it means to be accepted. If you look at the rock music, The rock music has a different feel to it, but it's a similar vibration where the rock music is a lot about victimization, right? The rock music isn't so much about look at my money and look at my guns and look at how I can kill you and all this stuff. But the rock music is about how my parents hurt me, how my girlfriend hurt me, right? Like the rock music is, is all about how my suffering is unique to me. And this is another aspect of narcissism that I haven't touched on yet, where, you know, most of us, most of us think that the narcissists are the perpetrators, but victimization is also a result of narcissistic consciousness. When I think that my pain is special, when I think that nobody's ever hurt the way that I've hurt. When I think that nobody's ever had their heart broken the way that I've been heartbroken. When I think that nobody's ever grown up with abusive parents or, or been a victim of narcissistic abuse, right? When I think my pain is special and I think I'm special because of my pain, that comes from narcissistic consciousness. And, you know, for those of us who feel like we're the victims, it is really tough to see that we are perpetuating that same consciousness by being a victim. But love, authentic love, does not go to victimization. Authentic love does not go to victimization. You see, authentic love acknowledges its suffering as a part of the human condition. That within our human lives, we all experience suffering. We will all experience abuse in different ways at different times in our lives. We will all experience rejection. We will all experience heartbreak. And because love recognizes this as inherent in the human condition, as a fundamental part of the human condition, there is nothing special about my suffering. My suffering does not make me special. My suffering makes me normal. 
It makes me equal. It makes me the same as everyone else. And so the only thing that awakens from that awareness is compassion and empathy. Because from the awareness that we're all the same, we all hurt, we all suffer. I don't want to make myself special. I don't want to say my suffering is worse than your suffering and nobody has ever felt the way I felt. What I want to do is say, I get your suffering. I feel your suffering. I know what that feels like. And that experience of empathy unifies us. I just have a couple more things I want to say on this, and then I'm going to open up to some questions. But I was in a relationship in, when I was 21 years old, I I dated a woman, she was 40 years old and she is the one person in my life I've dated that I would say is, is far enough gone on that spectrum to be considered a narcissist. And like, I don't even want to say a lot of the things she did because some of the things she did were just so atrocious. Not, I'm not even saying to me. Just some of the things I witnessed her doing in general were just so atrocious that I don't even want to say it because I don't want to sit here and say bad things about her. But what I, what I want to say is like, so let's look at where this woman came from. Because once she was an innocent child, just like the rest of us. And every narcissist that has hurt you in your life was once an innocent child, just like we all were. So where did this woman come from? What was her life story? Well, she was the daughter of a mother, single mother, who was determined to marry a rich man. And her mother actually ended up marrying a billionaire. And when I met her, her mother had been married to this man for many years. And he, I'm not even going to say who he was. He was somebody that you would actually know, but I'm not going to say who he was. Um, But her mother had been married to him for many years and he was her stepdad. Now, I don't know all the details. I just know what she shared with me. But when she was a child, her mother was so focused on marrying a rich man that she basically neglected the children. And the children just didn't get the love and the empathy that they needed. And what happened for this woman in particular, my ex-girlfriend, we dated for about a year. What happened to her in particular was, and again, I don't know all the details. I don't know exactly why it unfolded like this, but I know the theme of her childhood was neglect. Her mom was so busy out there trying to find a rich man that she neglected the children. And she ended up developing patterns of addiction and other things, but we'll just leave it addiction for now. And so at 40 years old, when I met her, I was 21 and she was 40. And I met her in recovery. We met through, through AA and and recovery And she was someone who had been struggling with severe addiction for the last 20 plus years. And what her parents had done, her mother, who was married to this billionaire, was they had basically disowned her from the family. And they had, they had hired a caretaker who was in charge of her. And she wasn't even allowed to see or speak to her mother. Or go to the family gatherings. And so she, she would see like pictures on Facebook of all her family, you know, being together for dinner, but she wasn't allowed. And, and her, her mother had bought her a house and put her in this house and hired a live-in caretaker to watch over her and monitor her life to keep her off of drugs. And every aspect of this woman's life was micromanaged and, and controlled and she was disowned by her family and, and she was basically shunned like, like an outcast. And the reason I'm sharing this 
And again, I don't know the whole story. I don't know everything that happened in her life to lead her to that place. I just know what she told me about her childhood and where she was when I met her. But given where she was, like given the life that she had lived, it makes perfect sense that she was who she was. There's a really enlightening book, which I... I don't love this book because I think it spreads a lot of fear. And so if, if you want to read it, I would say read it with caution. But it was very enlightening for me to read the book. It's called The Sociopath Next Door. And it was written by a, a woman. I don't remember her name. She's a doctor, a, psych, a psychiatrist. And she had worked with thousands and thousands of people who had, you know, been in in relationship with sociopaths, basically. And in this book, she talks about sociopaths, which is... Uh, I think the technical term is antisocial personality disorder. And then she talks about narcissists and what the difference between them is and all of this. But it was very enlightening to me when I read this book and and she shares, she shared about how um, there was something that was happening, I think during the world wars where um, there were a bunch of Russian babies who had been orphaned and American families were adopting these Russian babies And what was happening is several of these babies at a very young age were developing behaviors like wanting to murder their, their, you know, adopted sibling or, you know, just very, very destructive behaviors. And what she shares is that these were babies that were born into war times. They were orphaned from birth. In the very early stages of their life, they had never been touched or held, but they had basically been left alone in a bed in these massive orphanages. And, you know, what develops in the consciousness of a human being from that kind of severe neglect, like it makes perfect sense that they would, that they would develop an extreme tendency like narcissism or like antisocial personality disorder. And what I want to say is like, these are the people who are hurting the most among us. And you've all heard the saying that hurt people hurt people, right? You've all heard the saying that hurt people hurt people. And these people that have experienced possibly severe abuse, severe neglect, severe lack of worthiness and acknowledgement. And their only defense against that has been to create an overinflated, grandiose self-image to overcompensate for the deep feeling of lack and emptiness that they feel within their hearts. And these people are deeply, deeply wounded and deeply, deeply suffering. And to try to overcompensate for that, they go out in the world and they manipulate, they control, they dominate, they disregard, they ghost, they ignore, they use sex as a conquest. They use relationships as toys. And these kinds of behaviors are their only way of feeling okay about themselves. And if you could just imagine what it's like to live in the consciousness of a human being who feels so empty and so deprived of love that the only way they can feel satisfaction in their life is to hurt someone else. If you can really imagine what it's like to be that person, then you can recognize that even though they might have hurt you, you are the lucky one. Because you still have the capacity to love, which is something they will probably never have.
But this is where you have the responsibility to elevate yourself. The one relationship I had with a narcissist, which is what I was speaking about earlier, the one relationship I had with that woman who was a narcissist, what I learned from that is that I deserve better. And it took me about a year. Now, at that time in my life, she was my first relationship when I got out of jail. Okay, she was the only person I had met who would give me the time of day after getting out of jail. And at the time, I was looking for someone to make me feel special. I was looking for someone to make me feel worthy. I was looking for someone to make me feel like I was enough. She was looking for the same thing. You know, my approach may have been a little more authentic than hers because to a degree I wanted love where to a degree she wanted to manipulate. She wanted to harm. She wanted to control. That was her way of feeling enough. My way of feeling enough was to be loved, right? If she loves me, I'll be enough. For her, it was like, if I have power and I can manipulate and control, then I'll be enough, right? So our approaches might have been different. My approach may have been slightly healthier than hers, but what we were seeking in the relationship was fundamentally the same. We were saying, we're going to use each other to fulfill ourselves, And what I learned about myself in that relationship was that I deserve better. And I spent a year of my life bending over backwards, doing this, that, and the other thing, trying to prove to her how great I was, trying to solve all of her freaking life problems and the toxicity of her life and the mess of her relationship with her parents and, you know, just, just trying to be everything for her and thinking that if I just did everything and, and showed her how loving I was and how much she could rely on me, that she would finally love me. And I mean, I'm sure a lot of you have done this, so you know what it's like, right? But that that experience that I found myself in was a reflection of my approach. And that relationship was complete when I learned that I deserved better than that. And from that moment, I went on in my life And I never experienced, or or let me say, I never pursued a relationship with someone like that ever again. And so the fault was not on her for being who she is or who she was at that time. I don't know who she is now. But the fault was not on her for being who she was. It was on me for not knowing what I deserved and pursuing a relationship with someone of that quality. For me to turn around and judge this poor, traumatized individual for her inability to love, that would have just been adding more toxicity to the already existing toxicity. The healed way to look at it is to have compassion for her pain and her suffering and her trauma and the life that she had been through. To have compassion for the fact that she doesn't have the capacity to love. And to instead recognize what I deserve and not allow someone who is wounded to that degree to take up space in my life. So this is, what do I want to say here? When it comes to dealing with narcissism, when it comes to dealing with those 
highly, highly wounded individuals in our society who find their value in harming and holding power over other people? The answer is not to punish or judge them for being that way and put ourselves on some kind of moral high ground because we think we're better than that. As soon as you do that, you become the same as that. The answer is to have compassion and empathy for where they are and the pain and suffering that they must be in and to elevate ourselves to a level in which we are no longer attracted to that. And I want to say just, um, I want to say one more thing. I, I meant to touch on this earlier and I forgot about it, but I want to come back to it because I think it's important. So I spoke about how the men and the young boys in our culture get these messages from rap and rock music about the grandiosity of look at how much money I have. Look at the kind of car I drive. Look at how many women want me. Look at, you know, and then I think rock music is more the, the, my pain, right? Look how I've been wounded. Look how much I'm suffering. Look how alone I am. Look at how no one understands me. Right. And these are the messages that I think rap and rock music, um, Largely, it's not all rap and rock music, but largely it's, it's the themes that you get from rap and rock music, which most young people listen to. I think the young boys in our culture get a lot of that, uh, those impressions. The young girls in our culture get different impressions but they are vibrationally of equal quality. And I think the, the way it shows up most clearly is in music like Taylor Swift. And I love Taylor Swift, okay? I mean, I don't really listen to her, but, uh, but I just, I think she's a very talented musician. I, I, think, she's, I think she's amazing. Like she, she's an amazing, amazing, very talented human being. But her music, and, and, and music like her, so I'm, I'm using her as an example, but I don't mean to call out Taylor Swift specifically, and I don't even mean to say anything negative about her. Again, I think she's an incredibly talented person. But the impressions in her music, and, and the reason that her music, I mean, she's probably one of the most popular artists in the world right now. And the reason is because she plays off of this superficial love story. This, it's all about what I was talking about earlier, that specialness. That specialness to elevate myself above other people through love, by being loved, by finding that special love, by being that special someone to someone, by being loved in that way. And what her music does is it evokes that in young women and, I mean, everybody really. I mean, when I listen to her music, it evokes it in me, okay? <laughs> like, like it, it evokes, that is what her music evokes. It evokes this, this desire for special love combined with the special suffering on the other side of it, right? So it's the desire to be loved in that special way. And then the suffering on the other side of it, which is like the special suffering that I was left. I was, why, why aren't I enough for you? Why don't you love me? And as I've spoken about earlier, these are, these are equal expressions of narcissism. Right? We tend to think of narcissism as something the, that the perpetrator does. But that victimization is just as much a quality of narcissism, right? That feeling, that special pain, that nobody knows my pain. Of course people know your pain. It's the same pain we've all been experiencing since the beginning of time. Stop thinking you're so special and wake up to the fact that you're just like the rest of us. 
And when you do that, you will empower yourself to love truly and authentically. So the reason, the reason for today's discussion, and I want to end with this, is I want to elevate this conversation of narcissism in our culture. I want to elevate this conversation of, you know, how we treat and deal with narcissists. Because narcissists are not the evildoers. They're not the boogeymen. They're not the, like, they are the most wounded among us. And those of you who hear this message and have a consciousness above that of a narcissistic person, like, what I would say is stop lowering yourself to their level. Elevate yourself to the level where you can see who they are. You can see what they're going through. And rather than being attracted to that and wanting them to love you and beating yourself up because they don't, recognize that there's no love to be found there because they have no love to give and meet that with empathy. Meet that with compassion. And as you learn to meet those kinds of people or that quality of person with love and empathy and compassion, your attraction to that will fade you will no longer have space for people of that vibrational quality in your life. And that will be replaced with a recognition of your own worth and your own value. Because I want to say this, the more you love truly without conditions without specialness, the more you love truly, the more you recognize your worth. And the more you recognize that you have something to give. Because what we all want in this world is love. And I don't, I don't mean that special love, like make me special with your love. I mean, we want the kind of love that sees us truly, right? Like I see you, I see who you are. I see your struggle. I see your pain. I see your challenge. I see all the thoughts and feelings of unworthiness and doubt and fear. I see all of that. And not only do I see it, but I see beyond it. And I see that even though you hold those negative impressions and those disempowering feelings about yourself, I see that even though you hold that about yourself, I see that you are more than that. And I see the love that is within you. And what I, what I really want you to get is that when you can see everybody that way, unconditionally, when you're no longer enrolled and convinced by the grandiose shows and displays that people put on, and you can see through that, but not judge it. Instead, meet it with love and compassion and empathy. You will have no problem finding love. You will have no problem finding love because what people are going to feel from you is something that they are craving in their very soul.
And that's what healing looks like. And this will be the last thing I say. Those people who hurt you, those people that you call narcissists, they are the ones that are your greatest teachers in this respect. Because if you can do it with them, you can do it with anyone. And the ultimate goal is to be able to do it with everyone. Because viewing everyone in that way is the most authentic possible way you could show up to life. That is the way that is completely in alignment with the truth of who you are. Because you are love. Okay, so that being said, I'm going to open up for questions now. And um, I've seen I've seen a few questions come in. Those of you who have questions, go ahead, drop them in the chat. I'm going to scroll back through here and just see what, what questions I want to start with. I've seen a few of them come in and then, um, and then I'll figure out where I want to start and we'll go with that. All right. Okay. This question comes from Marie Callison and she says, I'm afraid to love. I never do. Nobody broke my heart, but I'm really afraid to give men the opportunity. How can I go on? Uh, First thing I want to do is just send you some love because it must be really hard for that to be your living experience of life, right? That must be, that must be tough. So I just want to acknowledge that first and just acknowledge the suffering that you're probably living in and how lonely that must feel and how empty that must feel. And you say, I'm really afraid to give men the opportunity to break my heart. And so First, I would say that somebody must have broken your heart at some point, and maybe it wasn't in a romantic relationship, but what you are describing right now is a trauma response. You are describing a traumatic response to love. And I don't know where that came from, but if you, if you do some reflection on your history, maybe your relationship with your parents, maybe your relationship with your friends in grade school or you know, some things you might find where that pain started. But this fear that somebody will break your heart and this unwillingness to experience that, I I mean, there, there are a few things I want to say here, but I guess the first thing I would say is that heartbreak is part of life. So if you're not willing to experience heartbreak, you're not really living. You're just like sleepwalking through life. Like, do you really get that? Like the most, the most really alive experiences that are available to you. Like the, the only way to really be alive is to open yourself to all the experiences of life. And so what you're doing is you're closing down your authenticity. You're closing down the truth of who you are to try to protect yourself from a feeling. Like, I want everyone to get this. You're so afraid to be hurt. You're so afraid to be rejected. You're so afraid to be ghosted. You're so afraid to have, you know, the person you're dating choose someone else. Like, you're so afraid of this, but all you're really afraid of is a feeling. And, like, this is, this is not a criticism. This is not an insult. But, but I want you to wake up to this. Like, can you see how weak it is to be afraid of your own feelings? Like, can you really see how weak you are as a human being when you are unwilling to experience your own feelings? Like, that, like that's, that's you. 
That is your life force. That is your energy. Like your, your feelings are the energetic life force moving through you. Your feelings are what remind you that you're alive. And the unwillingness to experience your own feelings makes you weak as a human being. And to answer your question, you say, how can I go on? I mean, I think you, first thing is that I think you just have some healing work to do. And, you know, you could start in therapy, find a good therapist to work with. Like if, if you want to know how to go on, this is how to go on. Start healing this, right? Stop accepting this unwillingness to get your heart broken as, as an okay thing in your life. Like start saying, no, I'm better than that. I deserve more than that. I want to live. I want to be alive. I want to feel. Like choose that for yourself. Love yourself enough to choose that for yourself. Like this paradigm that you're living in of I'm not going to open my heart because I don't want to get hurt and I don't want to give a man the opportunity to break my heart. This paradigm you're living in is a paradigm of self-hate. And everything that you're afraid that men are going to do to you, you're already doing it to yourself. Do you see that? All the pain that you're afraid you're going to experience when somebody breaks your heart, you're already feeling it by breaking your heart every day. But instead of, instead of experiencing this deep, intense pain that comes with heartbreak, and, and then also on the other side of that, having the opportunity to experience this enchanting aliveness that comes with truly engaging with life and truly loving, you've traded all of that in. You've traded the alive experiences of life, the reality of being alive, the truth of being alive. You have traded that in for a kind of numb flatness. that just pervades your daily experience. It's just this kind of dull numbness that you don't really feel much of anything. This is what people do with medication, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing medication, okay? I think, I think medication can be a powerful tool, and by the way, I'm not a doctor, so you probably shouldn't even take my advice on this, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it, and you can do with it what you will is that the way I have seen medication work well with my clients is when somebody is going through a period of emotional turmoil that makes living their daily life and fulfilling their daily tasks impossible or borderline impossible. And they are able to use some kind of medication for a limited period of time and in a limited way to slightly dull the experience of that suffering so they can get back to living a normal life. And in, the, in, in, uh, in cooperation with therapy, right? So the medication is not a solution, but it's a tool. And they use this tool in combination with therapy. And, and as they as they work through this, like maybe it's intense grief, like the loss of a child or the loss of a loved one, or, or maybe it's, you know, like a deep, deep heartbreak of, you know, your husband walked out on you or something like that, right? Like when you're experiencing deep emotional suffering, medication can be used to mitigate that suffering. And in combination with therapy, you can work through that pain in a manageable way. And you can have a plan with your doctor to be able to wean yourself off of the medication over a, a period of time, like maybe six months or a year. So it's not given to you as a life solution. Here, just take this and everything will be fine. 
but it's given to you as a tool to support you in working through some really heavy stuff, right? So it could be medication. It could be anything else. But when you refuse to feel the feelings of your life, when you choose to close down that part of yourself, you replace the experience of being alive and being fulfilled with a kind of dull numbness. And you feel empty and you feel worthless. And, you know, in the short term, in the short term, you might feel that you are avoiding heartbreak. But in the long term, what you ultimately find is depression. And this is why it's so interesting that people on antidepressants become depressed and suicidal. Right? Like, it, like, how does that even make sense? This thing was supposed to cure your depression, and yet, you know, it ends up making you suicidal. Right? Why does that happen? Well, it's because what it's doing is it's repressing something, but it's not getting rid of it. And if you don't deal with what's there, in the long term, it'll catch up with you. So, going back to the question... How do, you, how do you go on from this? Find a good therapist would be my very first recommendation. Dive into therapy. Tell your therapist, I want to learn to love. I want to learn to be vulnerable. I want to learn to open my heart with someone. I want to develop the capacity to feel everything fully. And start working on it. That's how you move on from this. Love yourself enough to stop accepting this mediocre quality of life as okay. Right? Like, like get it. You deserve more than that. You deserve more than a mediocre base level quality of life. Love yourself enough to give yourself that. Great question. Beautiful question. Sending you lots of love, and, and I hope you find the healing that you so, so deserve to have. Thank you for asking. Thank you. All right, so I'm just going to scroll through here. Um, there are a few more questions I want to get to today. Okay, Belizima, great question. Um, Belizima, good to see you, by the way. Glad to have you back on this week. Um, Belizima is asking, how can you tell the difference between narcissistic behaviors versus a narcissist? There really isn't a difference, right? Like, but I could, I would say there's a spectrum, right? So there's, there's kind of the average person and the average person I would say has a lot of narcissistic tendencies, which we've spoken about today. And then they also have a lot of tendencies that are not narcissistic, right? So they do have the capacity for empathy. They do have the capacity to love. They do have the capacity for kindness and generosity, right? So the average person has a lot of both, but there's a spectrum, right? So uh, the average person is kind of somewhere in the middle. And then on the one end of the spectrum, you have people who basically have nothing else or I mean, we all have something else, right? We're all, we're all made of love, but on the far end of the spectrum, there are people who really don't exhibit much more than their narcissistic tendencies, right? Their narcissistic tendencies pretty much pervade every area of their life. On the other end of the spectrum, you have people who have very few narcissistic tendencies, maybe none at all, right? These are people who have done a lot of healing work. These are people who are, have a strong, uh, capacity for empathy and compassion and understanding. And they have developed that capacity to a point where it is their natural reaction in, in every situation, right? So in every situation, they would respond naturally with empathy. And then there's people who are everywhere in between. But there's really not a difference between a narcissist and a person with narcissistic behaviors. In fact, through a loving perspective, what we would do is we would recognize everybody as a human being. 
and understand that there are certain human beings who exhibit very strong narcissistic behaviors. You know, my dad is someone who I would consider to pretty much be a textbook narcissist. Okay, you know, he he left his girlfriend of 18 years and ran off with another woman who was who was also married, right? And so he he leaves his girlfriend of 18 years for another woman who's married, ruins their marriage, and and then <clears throat> Not only did he do that, which is narcissistic behavior, but then in doing that, he also left his girlfriend with a bunch of unpaid bills and a mortgage that was going to fail and all this stuff <clears throat> and basically caused her to lose the house, lose, like destroyed her credit, got a car repossessed. And then he just, he just runs away and leaves her to deal with all of it. That's one example of, of some narcissistic behavior that I've seen my dad exhibit. Pretty bad, right? Like pretty, like pretty selfish. And yet there have been moments where I have seen my dad show signs of empathy. He wasn't very good at it. He wasn't very practiced with it, but there were moments when I have seen him exhibit something that looked like empathy. So I think even somebody that we would consider a narcissist may still have the capacity for empathy somewhere in there, right? And maybe if that person, like narcissists will often seek healing because they are suffering from things like drug addiction, depression, suicidal tendencies, things like that, right? So so narcissists will often get to a point of so much suffering that they start to seek help. And if someone can seek help, they could likely undo a lot of that narcissism. So it's, it's pretty toxic to judge someone based on their behavior rather than judging them as who they are. And who they are as a human being who is worthy of love and is made of love just like we all are. And so we want to, we want to recognize that these people are deeply wounded, have deeply destructive and toxic tendencies. We want to have boundaries that protect ourselves from the abuse that can come from a person like that. But ultimately, we don't want to label them as someone who's fundamentally fucked up and beyond repair, right? We might say, listen, your tendencies are too damaging and too toxic for me to have a relationship with you. And so I I may cut you off. I may create strong boundaries. I may remove you from my life. And at the same time, in my heart, I can love you and I can wish that somehow, some way you heal. Right. So, uh, yeah, I, I think calling someone a narcissist and granted, I just called my dad a narcissist. I was talking about my ex who I say is a narcissist. Right. So these are people who are very, very far gone on that spectrum. But we don't want to dehumanize them. Right. We don't want to take away their humanity just because they're deeply wounded. So great question. Great question. And yeah, I would say like the, the most important thing here, like I've said this forever is like, you don't need to know who is a narcissist and who is not. All you need to know is what you're willing to accept in your life and what you're not. Right? Like we really, we really don't need to judge people as narcissists. There's really no value in doing that. What, what we can do is say, I have certain standards of how I want to be treated, of how I want my relationship to be, of how I want to engage with other people. And when I'm, when I'm involved with someone, I want, like, I need them to honor those standards. And if they don't honor those standards, then we're not going to have a relationship. But calling someone a narcissist doesn't really have any value. It's, it's, it's basically a form of hate. And I I know, and I'll acknowledge, like sometimes here, like specifically about my father and my ex-girlfriend, 
I will sometimes talk about them as narcissists within the context of these conversations because I want to use that as an example to contextualize a conversation. But let me make it clear that in my heart, I see them as human beings and I see them as deeply wounded and I have a lot of compassion for what they're going through. Right. So I I don't, I don't dehumanize them in doing that, but I might point out those tendencies for purposes of the conversations we have here. But in reality, when you're meeting people, there's no real value in, in calling someone a narcissist. All, you know, that's basically a form of hate. Um, I would say maybe, you know, if a, a, a situation where I see it's relevant, is that if you've been in relationship with someone for a long time and you are able to identify that person as a narcissist because it it empowers you to get out of the relationship right so but but again you could you could say like this person has a lot of narcissistic tendencies right so i i don't again there there may be instances where being able to identify and recognize this behavior as narcissism is helpful and empowering to you. But in most cases, when someone hurts you and you say, oh, they're a narcissist, like that's not helpful. It doesn't help you and it doesn't help that person. It it doesn't help anybody. It's just another form of judgment and another form of making yourself superior to that person, which is its own form of narcissism, right? So I hope that makes sense. There's definitely some nuance here, but Really, as long as you have the ability to recognize narcissistic behavior within yourself and within other people, that's all you need. And labeling people as a narcissist or not is really not relevant anymore at that point. Great question. Thanks for asking, Belazima. Beautiful question. Um, Okay, I'm going to take one more question. Um, I just want to read this comment, um, beautiful comment from Renata Travel. She says, I went through that. My ex tried to kill me to keep my money. I went to hell alone because I I did not take medicine and go to a psychotherapist. I felt everything and healed myself. Now I love myself. And I just want to, I just want to acknowledge that. And thank you for sharing with us. And what a, what a journey, what a journey. And, you know, I don't know all the details of, of your journey, but I know this. I know that journey made you who you are. And you could not be who you are without that journey. Same way that, you know, growing up with a narcissistic father, going to jail, right? Like, like some of these major traumas of my life have made me who I am. And I couldn't be who I am without that. And of course, we would never wish for anybody to go through these traumatic things. And yet we all go through traumatic things. And these traumas create our strength. They create our perseverance. They, they deepen our empathy, our compassion. So even the traumas and the tragedies of life have a deep gift in them. And love recognizes and honors that, right? To dishonor that is, is to make yourself a victim. So thank you for sharing, Renata. Beautiful, beautiful share. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to end with this question here. Beautiful question from Irene San. She says, so how do you love yourself enough to not accept and tolerate unacceptable behavior? Beautiful question. How to love yourself enough to not tolerate and accept unacceptable behavior? To answer this, I want to say this is a conversation about raising your vibrational frequency. It's a conversation about raising your vibrational frequency because when you operate at a certain frequency, there's just an intuitive sense of not allowing things that don't resonate at that frequency. And it's not, it's not this big drama of, Should I leave them or should I not? Or are they toxic and do I need to cut them out of my life and block them? Like, like, let let me, let me use this as an example. I block people on social media constantly, like constantly. I block people on social media and it doesn't take much for me to block you. Like if, if I just see the right comment at the right time that has a certain flavor to it, 
that I'm like, you just don't fit here, <laughs> right? It's I just block you. Like if I'm if you're just if you're on my threads, if you're on my threads just like saying some stuff that just does not fit in my community, I just block you. You know, like if if you accuse me of mansplaining, that is one of those things that I'm just like, look, I'm a man and I coach women and I do it out of the love and goodness of my heart. And if you are going to receive me like showing up here every day and sharing everything that's in my heart to try to serve and help people, and you're going to turn that around and, and like diminish the value of that by calling it mansplaining, I don't hate you. I understand that you probably have a lot of trauma with men that is causing you to view this that way. But it's very simple for me. You don't fit in this community. And so I'm going to block you, right? Like when I, when I see things like that, I just block. And I do it very easily and very naturally. I do it without anger. I do it without hate. I do it without judgment. I actually do it with a lot of empathy and compassion for the person who made whatever comment it was or, or did whatever they did, right? But what it is, is it is just a recognition that I operate at a certain frequency. And I am only interested in being in community with people who share that frequency, right? I am not interested in being in community with people who don't share that frequency. And so when I see somebody who is clearly not sharing that frequency, it's very simple for me. I just remove you from my life and I do it with love. I do it with compassion, but I remove you. And that's, that's the best example I can think of to demonstrate how this works is when you get so clear about who you are and the life that you live and what you offer and the vibrational quality of your life and you are just really clear about that, you are also going to become very clear about when somebody does not fit that. It's just going to be intuitive. It's just going to be like the most natural thing in the world. And so I, I, I know you're, I'm saying like to raise your frequency and you're probably going, okay, how the hell do I do that? Right. And, and that's, that's a big question. But what I want to say, and I'll, I'll try to simplify it as much as I can right now. So what, what lowers your vibrational frequency? Trauma, limiting ideas about yourself, limiting beliefs, limited assessments of who and what you are, doubt, fear, shame, guilt, blame, victimization, judgment, right? Like these are all the things that lower your frequency. These are all the things that bring your frequency down. And so when you are operating in a frequency that is kind of orchestrated by all these elements, when, when your vibrational resonance is, is kind of orchestrated by all these different elements, well, that is when you are going to readily accept things into your life that are harmful to you because those harmful things are congruent to who you believe you are. So the the journey, the healing journey, is about releasing all of that. It's about releasing the trauma and the shame and the blame and the limited assumptions and and all this stuff. Right? it's, it's It's about healing those parts of yourself developing a new identity in which you recognize that you are made of love and you recognize that you have this incredible gift of love that you can share. And the more you share that, the more magic you create in the world around you. So to the degree that you have healed all that limiting stuff is the degree that you will recognize inherently the love that's inside of you. And and that I would say is like loving yourself, right? Loving yourself is not a hard thing to do. 
It's what naturally happens in the absence of all the ways that we hurt ourselves. It's what naturally haps, it's what naturally happens in the absence of our self-hate. And so you don't have to work so hard to love yourself. All you need to do is heal all the parts of yourself that are causing you to hate yourself. Heal all the parts of yourself that are causing you to be afraid and to doubt and to hold shame around yourself, to hold yourself in judgment, to carry guilt, to blame others, to be a victim, right? And when you heal all of that, your vibration will naturally be very high. You will naturally feel what fits in your life and what doesn't. Self-love will be a given because like you're like, it's, it's not even self-love. It's just love. It's the love that is moving through you and out into every other person and every other thing in the world. It's just the expression of what you are. Like, it's not about, I sit here and love myself every day. Love is what I am. It moves through me. It goes out to everyone and everything in the world. But when it comes to what I readily accept in my immediate space, you know, who I go to bed with, who I live, who I have in my home, who I spend my free time with, right? When it comes to those kinds of immediate factors, even though my love goes out to everyone and everything, when it comes to those immediate factors, there's going to be an intuitive sense of what resonates and what doesn't. And because I respect myself in the same way I respect everyone and everything in the world, right? Recognizing that everyone and everything is inherent or is, is worthy of that respect the same way that I am. Then part of, part of that respect is saying, Hey, you don't fit here, right? You don't fit here. And I love you. And I wish you the absolute best and you don't fit here. And that is natural and intuitive from that vibrational state of love. So beautiful questions. All the questions today have been just really, really beautiful. Um, The questions, the shares, it it has been really great to be with you all today. This is a big topic. Um, I, I I hope I've covered it well. You know, I was a little nervous to speak into this just because I know it's so nuanced. And it's such a challenging thing for people to, to really digest. And, and it causes us to face up to some things in ourselves that are uncomfortable to look at, right? So um, I just want to shout out to all of you who have really been able to integrate this conversation and, and understood it because this is, uh, it's powerful. And your life will only be that much better because of that. Um, I'm here every Tuesday at 12 PM Eastern time. I come on and live stream the podcast. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, I'd like to encourage you to subscribe to the podcast. It's called the conscious love show. It is available on all major platforms. You can find it on Google, Amazon, Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio. Um, anywhere you can find podcasts, you can find the conscious love show podcast. So if you don't want to always have to catch me live at 12 PM on a Tuesday, You can catch me anytime, anywhere, in your car, on your way to work, on the bus, wherever you might be. So um, sending so much love to all of you. Thank you for being with me today. I'll be back here next Tuesday, 12 p.m. Eastern time, and see you all very soon. Lots of love and blessings. We'll talk then. Take care. Thanks again for checking out the show. Please subscribe on whatever platform you listen to podcasts on the most. And I would love it so much if you'd leave a review and tell people what you think of us. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram at The Living Relationship to connect more closely. And I'm grateful to be supporting you on your journey to love.